Thank you. What an incredibly powerful act to follow. Thank you very much for that. I want us to get practical. But before we do, I have a confession to make. Um, I did something in my past I'm not uh, extremely proud of. And I didn't share it for a long time. And I hope for a long time we will not get into the open. Because uh, early in my career, I was a brand manager for a very iconic product. For a product that takes a lot of technology to make, a product that our grandparents didn't have, and a product that many of you have become so accustomed to, it, they even take it into their bedroom. Kitchen towel. <laughs> I was the brand manager, and I had a very simple job, grow this brand, and I did. New designs, new packaging, new advertising, TV, radio, print, direct mail, and it worked. We sold more than ever. My boss was happy, I got the promotion, and I shouldn't have done it. Because in my two years at the firm, I destroyed millions of company value. Here is the truth about kitchen towel. Customers don't care. I sometimes thought kitchen towel exists only to make every other product in the world look really interesting. <laughs> this is about price or about radical innovation. We were bleeding cash. We didn't have an innovation. We were a high cost firm. We should have sold this when it was big, not 10 years later for almost nothing. My job description was in the way because my job was to grow it. But I'm not the only one who gets this wrong. The BlackBerry team launched the Z10 campaign with a lot of money weeks before the entire firm folded because their job description said do advertising. And by the way, do you spot a little Samsung kid there pulling faces at them in the ad? P&G last year cut $200 million in digital marketing money without any negative sales effect. Money that the digital team would have spent because the job description says do digital marketing. And the guys who did this menu card went all the way, edited it, reprinted it, laminated it to tell you what you can't order anymore. <laughs> right? That's what job descriptions do. The people here in the audience, you, who are the people who want to fix what's going wrong in companies today, you have to answer a very important question. What's your real job? What's your real job? I don't think we're answering that question today. In fact, I think we sometimes don't even ask that question. Um, and it all started in 1922, when a guy called Maurice Wittels invented the job description. He went to a railway company and looked at the auditing department. It must have looked at, this is the Bank of England, but I'm sure it looked very similar. And he figured out that the clerks, the accountants were doing different jobs. They were separating the cash from the tickets. They were doing invoices. They were doing statistics. And he counted 19 different jobs. And he wrote them down in detail in what he called the job specification. And finally now, the firm was able to hire, train, recruit, and promote accountants in exactly the same way time and time and again. And almost 100 years later, we still love the job description. Right? We can hold people accountable. We can add fancy new competencies when we went to a, a mindfulness workshop. We can even give them to HR to write so we don't have to worry about people anymore. Yeah? That's all we can do. Yeah? The job description works really well under one important condition. What customers want doesn't change. On another day, the job description would be the perfect tool. Unfortunately, today is not another day. What we're seeing is the biggest shift in business since the Industrial Revolution. We are seeing a shift from the selling economy to relationship economy. The selling economy, if you just remind you, works like this, right? Someone comes up with a product, invents it, and because everything exists, we ask people to do something special, something unique. We want a USP, a pink cow, right? Something that's unique. And someone makes it, and then marketing and sales go out and sell it. 
So when the customer comes in the moment, it's there, it's beautiful, and they buy it. In a way, we perfected the one night stand in marketing, right? Pick me up now. And if you think about it, even digital marketing works pretty much in a similar way when you're chasing customers you know, along websites, finally you show them the, your ad. That's how we do it. But big changes are coming because someone has figured out how to do the relationship. Because of technology, what firms can now do is take all that feedback they're getting from customers and produce offers and services at scale, individualized, customer by customer, time and time again. And that's what happens because of technology in a relationship economy. This is my personal shampoo. I gave those guys who make these, this uh, brand my details about my skin and my hair, and they mixed for me, specifically these two bottles, they, they told me I need the orange and the pink one, among thousands of options. That's my personal shampoo. Needless to say, I lied about my hairstyle when I gave them my information, right? <laughs> if you want to buy a L'Oreal lipstick, right, in your country, what do you go? You go to a shop. Well, in China, L'Oreal completely changed the system, built a massive online store, and people actually buy direct. They built millions of new customer relationships in China. And if the one-night stand is still your thing, you're glad to know there is Porsche Passport. You can now get the confidence-building car, if you don't have the cash, at the monthly flat rate. And you still have a relationship, this time with Porsche. I mean, you all know these changes are happening. You're working at the leading edge of our industry. You've seen those. The question is, what is your job? Is your job to follow your job description and do marketing and do digital campaigning and sales and all the things you're doing? Or is your job to be brave enough to actually challenge the agenda, bring out new ideas, come up with new ways of working, and actually deal with the pushback which will be the only thing you'll be guaranteed to get in your, in your organization if you want to drive change. Pushback, that's the guarantee. So, how brave are you? Now, I promise you'll be practical. Let's do some real work. I'd like to go on a journey with you to 2023. And perhaps we can dim the light. I'd like you to think about your organization, and I'd like you to go on that journey with me five years out. And if you don't currently work anywhere, pick an organization where you like to work. And if you're brave enough to do this, I'd now like you to close your eyes. Picture yourself in that organization, your current one or the one you want to be in. It's 2018. 2019, 2020, 2021, 2022, 2023. Five years out, you are in that organization, in that place. And I'm now going to ask you two simple questions. This organization had its best ever year. It thrives like never before. Question number one, what was, the, what was the big challenge your organization has overcome to now be so successful? Question number two, people speak highly of you in 2023 because you took a brave action that helped that organization be so successful. What's the brave action you took? And 
And once you know, I'd like us to come back into the room. And write that one piece of action, that one piece of brave action on the very top of your to-do list. I want to end with a very short story. Some of you have heard this. It's an incredible story that happened just a couple of weeks ago. This is a bus in Paris. And a gentleman by the name of uh, Monsieur Lebert wanted to get on that bus with his wheelchair. Unfortunately, none of the passengers made space, although there was space. And the driver saw this. And he took a brave action. He made an announcement saying, this bus, bus stops here, everybody get off. So people got out of the bus angry, shouting. And as everybody was off the bus, he invited Monsieur Lebert with his wheelchair to come in, shut the door, and drove him to his destination. It's the brave people who make great things happen. And the path to bravery is not in your job description. It's in your minds, and it's in your hearts. You just got to be brave enough to find it. And let me end with one quote by Henry Kissinger, which uh, I think ties in very nicely with something that Caroline said earlier. A leader doesn't deserve the name until he or she is willing to occasionally stand alone. Be brave. Good luck. <laughs>